Ladies and gentlemen, welcome on board. I'm very pleased to be here and I would like to thank Claudia and all the Vihavar Acoustic Workshop team for the invitation. We'll speak a lot about X-ray computed tomography, exploring many of the applications to the violin maker's life. Since now on, we'll refer to this long name as CT. We may wonder why I choose the title, A Path to Teleportation. Even if teleportation is not yet available, we'll see how much CT is close to this uh, fantastic system and how much can help in our life. As a maker, I have always been interested in having uh, something like a good De Jesu or Strad in my bench, in my bench, over my bench when I'm making my violence. So teleporting something like a Stradivari or De Jesu is something that I always dream of. And as any academic research, as any serious research, I started from literature. And one of the most famous teleport system was in the Enterprise spaceship in Star Trek. It uses a very, very special light, as mass as CT can uh, make use of a particular range of X-ray light. So let, let's make our first online experiment. Let's teleport a Stradivari and see what happens. And a Stradivari is the most common request, sorry for the other makers. Well, Something happened. Can you see it from the screen, Claudia? Something yeah. new? Okay, thanks. But the resolution is not exciting. And all the crew say, let's improve the resolution because it looks like a medical CT. Nothing against medical CT. But here we have a first important information. With industrial CT, you can use higher resolution than with medical CT. Uh, and we, you can also tune, fine tune uh, the working parameters with more freedom. So let's ask this uh, Star Trek uh, crew to make a, center, a second attempt with improved resolution. And okay, we have a good <laughs> improvement. But um, we, we, <laughs> we have the second lessons. Um, it is very important the communication the communication between the makers and the people that are working on the CT. So it is important to, to, to give them what you really want from, from the scan. So let's type a Stradivari and on a dot Stradivari and see what happens in our third experiment. Well, we have really a good improvement, not bad, looks like a violin, but Dr. Spock is not really excited about it and has something to say. And the third important information, uh, while Star Trek is a really a consolidated technology, industrial X-ray CT is still a young one. So expect to have to make a few attempts when you are setting up your CT uh, scan of your instrument. So let's go to our systems. I, I would like to thank Tech Aerolab, Tech which is a leading company in non-destructive te testing in Modena, Italy. Uh, since 2014, we are developing a lot of application for makers. And so here we, here we have how a teleport look like in 2020. You have the small one, which is indeed a big one on the left where you can put also a cello inside for going at high resolution in a small part of the cello. Of course, uh, the violin scan that you will see in this uh, presentation was can use this system. And then you have the big teleport system on the right, pretty much close to the one of the Star Trek, where you can scan uh, uh, also double bases if needed, and harpsichord also. So this is how it looks like, but then we still have a lot of things to learn on how it works. So is the CT the actual teleport? And I can say yes, because it converts a physical object like a violin into information, into bytes, into something that is immaterial. 
And these bytes can be moved easily from one place of the world to another. And then somebody else and something else can perform this rematerialization. So we, we own, we have actually have the possibility to use teleport in 2020. So let's start our journey into CT. But before that, it is important to ask for some help. So maybe the force we be with you in order to with, withstand my presentation. <laughs> uh, so in order to not get lost during our journey, I prepare what is a map of the journey. We have three main highlands. On the left, we have the dematerialization highland. Here, real stuff is converted into numbers, into information. And we will mainly speak about CT, how it works, how it can be used at the beginning as a diagnostic tool. And also, very important, how CT can be used as a metrology tools for make makers. We will speak also about 3D light scanning with uh, a simple system, I think quite affordable system that can be used, but with high precision, even uh, in uh, our shops. Then we'll move for a while in the digital workbench area because it's okay. We can convert violence into bytes, but uh, during the path, me, me, we may want to modify, edit this virtual violence for a, serial, for a series of reasons. So we'll stop for a while also in this island. And at the end, we'll move to the second part of the teleport system, the rematerialization island with 3D printing and building, with the creation of two-dimensional templates and 3D replica. Okay, let's start from the beginning. How dematerialization work? How the object are transforming into bytes. In CT, in industrial CT, you have basically the object, the violin, that is rotating. And on the left, we see the detector, which is normally a flat panel detector. And when the X-ray are emitted from the X-ray source, they go through the air, through the object, and they hit the detector. And what we see is something similar to the picture on the right. But then we need to take something like 2,500, 15,000 projection for each violin or each part of the violin, for instance, of a scroll. And um, so the first part is putting the instrument inside the box, inside the scanner, taking a lot of projections. And this take time, something like 20 minutes, one hour, typically. Then this is only the first part of, of the process. When we have all these projections, which are in fact simple radiography, we need to convert them into what we call a CT volume. A CT volume, it is something completely different from the projection. For doing so, we need a, a big computer. And this computer load all these projections into the reconstruction software. Then a, an algorithm such as the filter back projection is performed. Eventually some calibration can be made. A little bit of human touch can be performed also in this operation, but not so much. So if we start for, from good projection, we will have a good uh, CT volume. And at the end, what we have a CT volume. What is made of a CT volume? If you think of any pictures, a picture is made of a small square elements called pixels. A CT volume is like a 3D pictures made of little cubes we name voxels. From now on, we will, you will listen quite often the terms voxel that stands for volumetric picture element. And then when we have to store all this volume made of voxels, we usually convert it into the stack of slices of images. These are separated by a distance that corresponds to the voxels edge. Data are huge 
from two to 200 gigabytes is typical for an instrument or of a part of the instrument. But, and then also, um, a first problem is that when you want to see a CT volume, you need at least twice or one times and a half uh, the same amount of random access memory of the data set. So you need a big computer as Ari Merson quite well know. So, uh, but when you have this volume, you, you, you can start looking at it and exploring it and you can grow through its slices, which is the most common things that normally people do uh, with CT in medical, for instance. And uh, you need a special software for it. There are commercial softwares like Volume Graphics or Aviso that are the most efficient and productive uh, tools for going through thousands of big slices. There are also open source alternatives, such as the one that I listed is Fiji, in that um, a different way of calling image A and 3D slicers. They can be used, but they are not so good and effective as the commercial uh, software. And when you first inspect a volume, just to see that the, the scan was correctly performed, you go through the volume with uh, these um, three slices that are octagonal slices or you look at it in three dimension. Later, we, if we have time, we'll take a close look to a violin in using the, one of these tools. So in 3D inspection, you can have different approach for 3D rendering, also for 2D slices, but for 3D, 3D rendering, the freedom is more. For instance, you can plot just the surfaces of the object. And then you can, for instance, see, uh, I don't know if the resolution of your, uh, of, the, um, of your screen and the connection is good, but you can see dimples or features that are related just of the from, from the geometry point of view. Then we, you can move um, to volume rendering mode. Volume rendering is a different way of presenting reality in which you can imagine that uh, you have also information on the density of it of the object or what it is in, in surface but somehow you look a bit of in transparency of the object then if you want really want to look in transparency as in a normal x-ray you can move to the x-ray mode and then you can have additional information for instance in this example that was scanned in, in Modena we started from the its surface, then from having more information like here, sorry. Here you see um, this are lighter area, probably some uh, wood worm um, replacement with some high density filler. And then when we move to the X-ray view, we have additional information. So it's a very powerful tool. But don't, don't, do not get, get lost, please. We started how it works CT, how can we use as a diagnostic loop. Then we move to the metrology for makers. And I think this is a very, very important application, even more than the simple diagnostic. But if you want to make measurement on your virtual violin, if you want to take a virtual caliper and measure it or make slices or whatever you want, you need first to convert your CT volume into surfaces that can be used with different software or tools you need to use for them. So the first mandatory step is to have a very good surface determination. If you want to make measurement, uh, thickness, evaluation, so on, you need to have a very good surface. Then start some little problems. If you want to scan your violin with strings on, you may have a lot of artifacts that are caused by the presence of metal that have a quite different density, uh, radiographic density in particular, from the wood itself. Um, I will move to a video of this viola. Just tell me that you are looking at the video. Okay. Yes. Thanks, Claudia. So 
In this video, you see an example of X-ray CT that was made of one of my viola as a test. And um, here is okay, but when we move to a region where we have a lot of, we have a lot of metals, uh, we found what's called artifacts. This can be reduced, we can do better than this, but it is already, I think, a good result comparable to a medical scan, for instance. A medical scan are uh, built, the devices, the scanner is built to maximize the efficiencies in uh, reducing these artifacts. In industrial CT, you have to fine tune parameters to avoid them. And you have to know in advance and to inform people that you need to, to scan a violin with strings on or without, because the, the parameters have to be tuned in a completely different way. Uh, this is a good compromise for, for looking at the wood and having not so much artifact, but it is not ideal if you want to make surfaces out of this instrument. For instance, I will skip to this region where we have most of the troubles. So when you, when you move uh, to, the, to the area where the windings here, the windings of the strings of the very precious Eva Pirazzi gold strings are made uh, with very high atomic number and density material. And uh, you have a lot of problem in having a good information in this area. So I will, sorry, I will stop this. And let's can, come back to the surfaces. There are many tools for uh, creating surfaces from CT. It is one of the simplest is to use ISO surfaces. But then even if we have a violin without strings that have been scanned with an industrial scanner, we still have to face one feature of, of the violin, which is spruce, that has very different density in the late wood and early wood. So if, for instance, we calculate the surface of uh, a violent top using the density of its early wood, we will end up with uh, a surface that is slightly overestimated. So we pump a little bit the violent. And on the other hand, if we use the parameter of the late wood, we'll skin out, we we'll remove information from the region where early wood is present. So it is better not mandatory, but it is better, I think, to use a local uh, threshold approach as the one used by the commercial software, in which locally I fine tune the position of the surface according also to its gradient in three dimension. It's something complicated, but at the end is very useful because it produces more reliable results that we can use, for instance, for taking measurements. So um, it is very important for me as a maker to have the correct information about dimensions. So I can take measurements uh, from virtual violence made of virtual surfaces using tools that mimic the real tools. So for instance, on the left, this is measurement made on a 3D replica of the violin. On the right, the same geometry, but virtual, can be measured using a virtual caliper. I can uh, uh, use a virtual caliper in the, in the moment that I give him some information su such as take a um, distance from this plane to another and this plane has to be fitted to this part of the violin with this criteria. Something complicated, but not so different from reality. One thing that is very interesting for me as a maker is the possibility to create a silhouette of the object, the same that you see in Strad or the same that you actually make with a pencil going in the outline of the instrument. Those you can do it virtually and you can make sections and cut like, like the one you see in the right. So uh, if you have a violin coming into your shop, you make a city, then you create your own set of templates or for cutting out your scroll and, uh, and the archings and, and as well. Now, 
this is very interesting also for, for makers because uh, we can compare the two-dimensional outline that I can obtain cutting the ribs in the middle, close to the back, close to the top, and project them in a, in a plane. So I can speculate which is the optimal uh, outline for cutting my own uh, template for the mold, which is the optimal outline uh, for carving the, the corners, uh, carving the blocks uh, and making uh, ribs that are somehow faithful for the original. This is not possible with pictures. This is quite easy with CT or you don't even need a CT. If you have a scanner or laser scanner that left the one that was showed by the Museo di Virino, you can perform the same kind of operation. Of course, you cannot perform in the surfaces that are inside the instrument. And this is a must. Uh, if you want to have information inside, you need to use CT. Then you can have one millimeter contour lines like these that they were um, plotted in, uh, in my viola, the same viola that you saw in the, in the in a video. And this can be very useful also. And you can have arching profiles. These profiles, for instance, were not taken in an industrial CT, but uh, uh, from a medical CT scan. So uh, if you have a collection of medical CT from past, it's, uh, I think uh, there, there, there have been a, a great improvement in the software that can allow you to use even lower resolution data to get a reasonable accuracy in, uh, in arching and so on. Then you can have thickness maps. And of course, this can be seen as a control process of your own production. <laughs> I don't think it is something that maybe some, some makers can, can do this. Uh, I, I did this just because I made a demo on this on this viola, but um, of course this is more interesting if you are dealing with great important instruments. And of course I can show you only in pictures that I'm allowed to show you. So let's get back to our journey map, and uh, we moved from the de dematerialization highland to the digital workbench. So we saw how can we transform a violin into something that is not material and how can we work with this information um, to fine tune them. Now, this is something that we will gonna see in the digital, digital workbench. So we have the information and we now see how much can we tune or modify this information. A first simple, things that we can do is to work on the meshes that we have from a CT scanner or from a normal scanner, from a light scanner. So if we have a viola, a typical data set is something in the order of 700 megabytes. We can decimate it to a uh, much lower dimension. For instance, if, if we take a part of it, just a corner, the original dimension is 60 megabyte. We can go for three megabytes without losing any interesting information. And we can smooth out all the uh, irregularity of the surface in order to have something that can be more useful for other purposes. One problem is that quite often, quite always, <laughs> the violence, the whole violence, uh, presents some warping. Uh, this violence was scanned during the first workshop we made in 2019 in Tech Hair Lab. The workshop was dedicated to makers. Some of them I saw are in the, in the participant today. Um, 3D printing of this object will reproduce also the defects, the features, like this warping of the violin. And also milling, a CNC milling a plate will produce inevitably a worthwhile plate. Um, it is interesting how much can we see this defect from this kind of images, while in reality it's not so easy when you hold the violin and you look at it from a normal distance. 
uh, in CT, you, you have the possibility to project things in parallel direction. And like looking from miles away, and you easily see the formation or any warping. Uh, some small deviation can be compensated working on the virtual model. As an alternative, a person can cut CNC mill a top with this deformation and then deform manually, as working with gypsum counterform, for instance. A further development, I, I hope somebody here in the particip participant already made something about it using finite element metal or other mathematical approach. I think it is possible to deform in a more realistic way this violence in, in a sense that to uh, remove the effect of the age of string tensions and put them of what is more reasonably the original dimension. So this is an example, an extreme example of removing a big deformation, just using uh, what is called cage edit in uh, Rhino 3D, which is a common surface modeler using a, a common CAD software, not so expensive. But I agree that only small deformation can be removed in a realistic way. And then we can check the effect of our work at the digital workbench and see how much it deviated from the original violin. We can, we can perform such something that we call actual versus nominal analysis, and we can color code this deformation. So blue is something that is inside or smaller than the original, and red is something that is bigger or outside the nominal original. Here you see the effect of what I have performed before, rotating the up about and uh, uh, the amount of this deformation when you compare to the original. This maybe is a silly example, but it's approach that can be um, can be used for comparing different violins of the same auto, different Stradivari, for instance, violins. Then we move to another interesting topic. A lot of uh, speculation was made and is made nowadays uh, regarding molds and uh, if a specific mold that's also in the Museo di Volino, for instance, was used for a specific violin. All these comparisons were made using pictures and sometimes using very precise 3D scanning, for instance, in the case of the Museo del Violino. Um, and also, uh, producing a mold is a very interesting and important step in makers. So having a correct mold shape, it is very important. So if I start from a picture with its deformation, I have to take into account, inevitably, that it's not exactly the best solution or more faithful. Some book already has some high resolution to these slices such as the one made uh, from Scola Vezza and Zarre in 2014, I think. And I designed this mold a few years ago using these slices, and I built, I built a few violas, including one that was scanned in the previous example. So I had my mold designed and cut with CNC. I had the viola that was made around this mold. Then this viola was, was scanned, so I have the model of the viola. And the question is, Will the mold fit again the virtual viola? Because this is what uh, we can do with very valuable instruments. But with this simple experiment, I can see how much deviation I introduce as a maker and uh, how meaningful is this comparison. So luckily, <laughs> the mold fitted inside the mesh of my viola with quite a consistent uh, fitting. And we can estimate the deviation of this fitting and see how much deviation I introduced with my work, especially in the area of the corners, but also in the middle of the ribs. What is the result of the deformation when you glue the ribs to the top and back, when you string the instrument? 
then you, you will have inevitably have some deformation. So it is a matter of discussion for further studies using this technology with valuable instruments. Some, something like provocation, I, I can see. Then a further step in the digital workbench is to move from a fuzzy irregular STL, uh, which is a polygonal mesh model that comes right out from the CT to something that is smoother, something that we call nerve surfaces. I hope no, nobody will get lost. Maybe somebody of you knows very well STL, nerves, and something a bit boring, but I think this will be even more important in the years coming, and, and especially for young makers. So if I want to make a good CNC milling, it is very difficult if I start with this extremely fuzzy surface for many technical reasons. It's, it's better to smooth out. And if I convert this fuzziness into something like a, a mathematical surface, then I can more easily edit this surface, put parameters, um, for instance, um, modify the height of the archings and so on. Now I we take a little break from, from me speaking and we listen to a video that was made, oh, sorry, that was made uh, for, um, for the workshop we had in 2019. Um, Claudia, do I have to do something for the audio for come out, coming out? What? Can you please speak? When you shared your screen, you had to tick on the option uh, sh uh, share audio from computer. If you haven't done it, you have to unshare your screen. Okay, you share again. And before you press OK, you, you know, when you share your screen, you have a prompt window. And then at the bottom on the left, did you see the little? Yes. Left? Can you hear something? Yes. Okay. So I hope this was uh, helpful in understanding the various passages. Um, another example of what we call reverse engineering or what's normally performed by makers just looking at a picture or having the instrument in, in, in their hands. In this example, this is a scroll that was scanned with, with a free uh, this scanner, a DIY scanner, and was converted into cut surfaces. We have 20 minutes left, so I'll maybe I'll hurry a bit. <laughs> and then we go to the third part from the first side of the teleportation to the second side, when we move 
from numbers to real stuff. We have few options. One is additive manufacturing. So the object is recreated layer by layer. And the other is subtractive manufacturing, such as CNC milling. Value makers performs a lot of subtractive manufacturing, starting from mood and coming to the end of the scroll, for instance, and quite a few of additive manufacturing just for the ground or the varnish, for instance. So it's a different word. Uh, you have different flavor of uh, um, polymer additive manufacturing. On the left, this is the Jesu Doria um, courtesy of Greg Alf that's listening to us. Thanks, Greg. You have a fused deposition modeling, something like a toothpaste um, extruded by a hot extrusion that is deposited in, uh, in every point of the model. So it's a long process, quite time consuming. Then you have different approaches to uh, powder sintering with laser, with hot sources, and you have the uh, results in the middle. And then the other families uh, starting from liquid resin with DLP or laser stereolithography in which uh, light, UV light or laser polymerize locally the liquid resin. This gives a very a better finish. So it's very nice to hold this object in your hands, but less consistent uh, properties or less durable properties is uh, much fragile than the others. And so it approaches as its own advantages and disadvantages. For you as a maker, it's probably less expensive to buy a FDM or a SLA printer for your shop, but not a, a laser sinter, which is quite expensive machines. Here we have a very nice example of what you can do when you scan a very nice instrument. You have Harry Merson, we woke up this morning at four and I say, ciao Harry. Ciao. <laughs> and he scanned <laughs> a Solivari Cristiani in 2017. And he, he and the Tech Herald team scanned this uh, cello. And then uh, what he made was to create with a very long time consuming uh, FDM process, uh, his personal replica of this cello. Then you have the different approach of, of manufacturing, which is the subtractive manufacturing. You remove wood in the same way that you remove with the gauge and sizzle and so on. This is CNC milling routing. This, this example was uh, made over what we show before as the blue surface, uh, the smooth surface, a smooth mathematical surface, a CAD step was created and inputted into the, um, the CNC milling machine. Using the digital workbench, you can design your own model. So when you start from a CT with all its artifacts and defects, you can move to something that is oversized in certain region that gives you a room for your personal uh, taste modification and so on. Something that is not possible if you, if you cut then to measure it. So in another example, you have a corner that's um, modified so that you can still um, groove your purfling and do all the necessary things on the corner in order to be your personal violin. Just to give you an example. That's the violin that was made using this part. Um, st still a lot of work, I understand, but a good starting point, I think. Uh, you can also uh, manufacture plates with, um, with some 3D printing technique, but still we are in the experimentation area, okay? You have a lot of problems of deformation when you cool this object from their uh, manufacturing temperature to the room temperature that we still have to face, but we are working on it. And the quality of a commercial printer is already something that's very interesting. You can see the label, you can see 
the um, the flames, I will call them. <laughs> Um, you can you can steal some subtle features. Uh, as I mentioned before, on the left we have what we call a DLP printer, starting from from liquid resin. On the right, starting from powder. Of, of course, it is better the one on the left, but the one on the right is good as um, as enough as a template for for certain measurement. Then we can uh, go at higher precision, if we CNC mill stuff, then we have a better reproducibility, we have a better accuracy in the overall measurement of the object, for instance, because 3D printing, at least 0.3-0.5% of errors, it is introduced. So it is not exactly as the same of, of the object you see in your computer, but a good reproduction. So um, in the future, I think they are going to um, voxel control printing. I mean, each part of the object can be theoretically printed with, with material of different colors and transparency. Um, Polyjet, IHP 3D, uh, some commercial um, uh, printer already perform these tasks. And then we have to work on the material because um, we have to end up with a material which is accurate, which is uh, which properties do not change during the years. And if we want to build a violin with 3D painting, then it's another <laughs> big topic. And the surface finish is a critical part of this printer. So what the industry is doing now is to work on automatic surface finish to smooth out these little irregularities. Um, a few words about what you can actually build and buy for making scanning, scanning parts into your workshop. Uh, my scanner is, I think, a cheap one. It's based on a commercial software that's HP 3D, formal David Leather Scanner. I just bought some used part and new, like the projector and the cameras. You have customizable hardware and field of view. Of course, you, you pay for what you have. You need to input a lot of time for setting up uh, calibration. And it is not as uh, plug and play as a 20,000 commercial system. But I think that is a good, um, can, can have the same accuracy of the commercial and expensive software at the cost of your time setting up all the stuff. Um, how it works? It works very well with white wood, not with varnished instruments, where it has a lot of limitation. But if you are working uh, with your violence, it can be a good idea to have a reference template, a 3D template of your archings, and to check this years later or to um, shape your preferred uh, back uh, archings and uh, CNC mill uh, tens of, of it and in order to use it in, in the years or during one year for some of you. So the camera that you saw at the left and the right of the projector record images of, of these black and white patterns and record their distortion and from that a software um, calculate uh, the 3D shape of the object. You can uh, you have to perform a few of these scan and then to fuse them together. So it's something that takes a bit of time. So this is a scroll that was scanned with this system, 24 scan fused together, two hours for scanning and fusing, clean a bit. And then you can, for instance, do a 3D print or whatever from, from that file. This is an early attempt that was made with, with the camera that I'm using here for myself. I use this camera, like a 20 euro camera and uh, a 200 euro projector. The software is in the order of 700 euro. So with 1000 euro, you can have a scanner with this kind of resolution. Working a bit with the parameters, you can do something better because this, this was really my first attempt with this system. Then I moved to more expensive cameras. 
but I think this is the most balanced uh, ratio between uh, money and, and, and what you have in terms of precision. So this was made with uh, better cameras. And, uh, and then you can have something like a control what you are doing and how much you are deviating for the ideal arching of a specific uh, maker of your reference template. We make a second interval, and then we have a few other slices. We made this in 2014 using the very first scan that we made at HackerLab, me and one friend, just to see the artistic side of CT. This is not just something boring for engineer, but something that has its own uh, uh, artistic dignity. <laughs> restoration on the back, on the back, in the southwest area. Very nice wood matching buttons. Credit this with uh, Matteo Sandi, uh, the, the filmmaker, and CT Hour Lab. Uh, this is the same video that we saw before regarding the various kind of surfaces. But now I understand the most common application of CT is used to identify, quantify document problems, damages, restoration, modifications, uh, and internal features val of valuable instruments. Um, now I can, sh I have a few minutes. I would like to show you something um, in, in real. Like this is a carbon bow, a cheap carbon bow. And if we start from one side, I'm, I'm just scrolling through many of the slices that I told you before, um, compose a, a CT volume. Here we can see, um, here is the varnish. Here, there are different rapid carbon fiber things uh, represented by, by Tim in his work. And then going through the object, we have this part that holds the plug and the hair. We have the different windings. We have the um, horse air that I use for playing the violin. So the resolution in this case is different from the resolution we use for valence, but uh, just to show you that you can tune parameters for smaller areas. You will see that the bow is actually as a void inside that was made during manufacturing. I didn't make a, a valence bow, but since carbon fiber is quite heavy, I suppose that some hair in the middle, some hair has to be put. And we have another example that was used from the beginning for showing uh, one of the main problems that are uh, this very cute um, tunnels. This is a cello ribs, a rib, a maple cello rib 
with some nice features. You see the uh, void that was left from the wood worms, and you see also what's left behind after he has heated and converted the wood in something else. And this is something that happens quite common also in violins. Also on this violin, this violin has quite of um, interesting features that you see here. For instance, a lot of these cute uh, things. And uh, so I understand that the first um, application of, of CT is always have always been and probably will be diagnostic because it allows you to see problems before you have to face them. But I think that in the future, um, more often we'll end up we'll end up with different application. Uh, if you want, I want to thank you because the presentation is finished and I uh, hope you are still alive. If you want more information. A list of publication is present in uh, this web page uh, where I put some of my work, not only of CT, but mainly on CT. And the first information you can um, contact me with, with my email. So we have three minutes for a few questions, Claudia. Yes, thank you, Roberto. Uh, Roberto, Francisco. <laughs> asking a question to Roberto before and sorry for this. Um, well, you live in a parallel world as well because you managed to have 59 out of 54 slides and you managed to be in December, 2019. So ah, you have the power to, to make you Teleport. where you want, even back in time. <laughs> okay, we would like to ask a question. Harry? Hi, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Hi, Harry. Uh, that was a wonderful presentation. Um, and I was on the edge of my seat watching all of it, even though I've had the opportunity to talk to you privately before. There are so many things that you did and talked about where I was listening and thinking, I wish I had done that, uh, which I mean is the highest form of praise for the tremendous amount of energy and work and dedication you've shown to these projects. Um, I just had a, a couple of comments. Um, one that um, I believe that a lot of this uh, 3D printing and CNC machining is not only of use to makers, but it's of great use to museums that have to take such great lengths to um, protect the instruments in their custody. And one of, the, for instance, the so-called personal model of the Cristiani cello that you you showed that I had made is not actually my model. I gave it to the Museo del Violino and I hope that they'll be able to put it in the museum and say, no, you can't take the original out of the case and measure it and hold it because we're worried you'll drop it, but you can drop this plastic print of it, which is dimensionally accurate and it only costs $500. So I think that the kind of technology you're talking about is of great use to museums to, um, for the dissemination of information about things in their collections. Um, in terms of the contemporary, you know, right now limitations on the kinds of things that you're talking about, I just wanted to mention two problems that I think are pretty big. One of them is money, always a problem. And the other is intellectual property. Um, the, the software that you're using like VG Studio Max I looked into getting a site license, you know, or, and uh, you can easily spend $25,000 getting uh, access to software like this. It's a huge problem. Um, and also, as soon as you've seen industrial scans, you look at the medical scans and think, how did we ever live with those? Because the industrial scans are so much more just fantastic. I mean, the vividness of the things that you showed were remarkable but um, they require a lot of memory to run. Um, I have the Cristiani data, which is like 200, like 200 gig of data. And e even if I wanna run a section of it at 100% accuracy, 
I, I finally broke down about a month ago and got a computer that's got um, 768 gig of memory of, of RAM so that you can look at these images. Um, it's, a, it's a real problem having enough memory. With regard to intellectual property, you know, you, you were saying, here's a viola I made. The, the, one of the huge problems here is, is the just um, the terrible difficulties of getting access to data. It's not simply the technological issues of getting the data, but how can you show them in public? Who does this information belong to? People who own instruments, whether they're private collectors or museums, there, there's almost a level of hysteria about information dissemination. It's a, it's a, some of it is connected to the economics of the field, and some of it is connected to, I, I believe, a kind of tribal, kind of primitive men mentality where if, if you have the CT data of an instrument, you've sucked its soul out, you know, and, uh, and nobody wants to share their soul with anybody. So there are huge political and economic problems quite apart from the technical problems in taking the tremendous advances that you've made and, and disseminating them to a larger public. And that doesn't mean it's a death knell. That doesn't mean this is uh, not worth doing. I'm just saying these are problems. Yes, these are problems and uh, uh, costs are going down. So as, as soon as new scanners are introduced into, into the market, uh, scanning a volume is going to cost a little bit less than four years ago, five years ago. Regarding memory, it is, uh, I have different opinion in the sense that uh, using, uh, for instance, BG, uh, you, the Christiani is something that uh, it is absolutely, uh, you don't need so much memory. So it's one times and a half the, um, the dimension of the data set for, so with the one tau, 200 gigabyte would be enough maybe for the body. So I think the ROS is not the optimal, optimal uh, um, tools for that. I think that, I hope that in the future, the open source, an open source for uh, software for CT is not yet available. As um, maybe in five years, we'll have something that has the same potentiality and uh, producti productivity of VG. That's my dream because I cannot afford a uh, license of VG. What you have seen is, a, what I've shown in my presentation is a result of a long time collaboration with, with the Tech Hero Lab uh, and in providing services uh, also for dealers and so, but also in developing a new application for, for makers. So this was made possible uh, thanks to them and thanks to the work that we developed, we developed together. Uh, but for instance, uh, 3D light scanning is becoming quite cheap as an alternative. Um, I, I think you're right, but uh, I think there are not definitely uh, a limitation. For instance, we can agree in a few makers and scan an instrument and uh, make an agreement on how to share this. Uh, actually, it is possible. If we are, we are in 10, we can scan a very nice instrument and have all the information that we want, keep for them or share according to what we decide. It's just a matter of willing a political also, of course, but uh, it's not, not nothing impossible, I think. Difficult, but not impossible. I agree. And thank you very much again. You're welcome. Thank for getting up so early in the morning. Yeah, thank you, Ali. <laughs> you contacted me to say whether it would be recorded. And I said, no, it's not the same as a live experience <laughs> that you actually decided to wake up early for this. <laughs> all of my eyes. <laughs> Um, Tim, you would like to ask a question. Yes. Uh, hi, Francesco. Uh, congratulations for the wonderful images uh, and, and the research that you have shown. It's really impressive. Um, I, I missed the beginning of your, uh, your talk, so it could be that I'm asking a stupid question. But uh, I just wanted to know, practically, um, you've showed uh, some scans from, from violins and violas. But uh, do you think your methods, that they are also applicable to larger instruments? And where do you see the boundaries of how large you can go? Can you scan a pianoforte or, or where, where is the boundary, do you think, uh, of these sorts of scans practically at the moment? Uh, there is no, no limit, no, but the, the boundary is 
uh, well over the musical instrument because uh, I saw in a Fraun Offer Institute in 2015, there were scanning caterpillars or huge container for um, a huge container is big enough. So um, of, of course, with the, the more, the bigger the object, the lower the resolution. You have to think to divide reality into 3,000, 6,000 parts, and then you have your uh, resolution. But for, for cello, we, we do it for double bases, not yet, because it hasn't been requested, but it is possible. Thank you. You're welcome. Next, uh, Harris. Thank you, Francesco. That, that was a wonderful presentation. Uh, you, your energy, the energy you are giving is uh, very inspiring. Uh, I wanted to ask you something about the diagnostics um, that you have shown. Uh, I've read in um, the book about the, the Messiah violin that uh, um, with the help of the CT scan, um, there was a detection of a small crack under the sound post. Uh, can you tell us some things about uh, what we can see in a CT scan that we cannot uh, easily detect by uh, eye? Uh, sorry, I'm coming. Uh, sorry, I miss you. Um, of course, everything that's inside the material, this is something that we cannot uh, detect um, with different system. Um, with some limitation, you can see everything that's inside the material. And in the moment that you have a little dif a small difference in contrast, in radiographic contrast, if you haven't any difference in radiographic contrast, then it's very difficult. So for the moment, glue, uh, animal glue uh, is clearly visible. I don't know if somebody is developing adhesive that are not visible to X-ray. Is that this is theoretically possible? And maybe it's uh, can be the team of a future research. But for now, you can see everything that is uh, a discontinuity in the wood uh, and uh, glues and so on. Um, the main advantages is going is looking inside the thickness, not not outside the thickness, of course. Okay, uh, so um, I imagine there is some sort of uh, service for the owner of the violin if they want uh, uh, to check uh, the condition of the violin. You uh, you can scan the violin and provide the service of um, assessment of the, the condition. Yes. Uh, is this um, uh, something that is expensive enough to do? Uh, only owners can do it, or can uh, um, a restorer come and uh, ask for it? Both, usually. Okay, okay. Uh, uh, one last thing about the, the intellectual property of um, the, um, the digital files and how you can replicate them uh, with 3D printing. Um, I just wanted to add that um, uh, at least makers and restorers uh, could uh, all agree to make uh, something like a very controlled private exchange of information of the digital files just for research or uh, just to learn. And maybe they can all uh, talk to to the owners about it so that the owners of the violins can um, more easily accept uh, as a first stage to give out the digital files. So not a commercial exploitation, but uh, something like an open source sharing community for uh, learning, maybe. I think this uh, was uh, already done in the past and uh, in the present. And uh, I think this is a very interesting topic that um, it's worth exploring. Um, I, I can't wait to, to listen to George speaking about gut strings. So I would not uh, know more. <laughs> if there are any questions, you, you can contact me. All of you can contact me uh, privately. If you are have some crazy project uh, nerd enough, we can speak about it. Okay. 
Uh, last question. Yes, Colin. A wonderful talk. Is the resolution on the density well enough to see compressional um, damage on the back plate and the top plate? Um, from possible uses in the early instruments of sound posts in different positions? Yes, you see compression. Um, I didn't make this such an estimate, um, but uh, I started working on the scintometry and the preliminary results are quite interesting in the sense that you can distinguish a light wood from a, a heavy wood with a reasonable, at least interesting accuracy. Going, uh, um, I think you can uh, you can clearly see the formation on the surface. If this was not reworked, I think, but um, this is worth exploring. But you need, uh, if if you want to have a good uh, answer to your question, then you will need to make a very um, a very accurate uh, scan with high resolution in just in the, in the specific area because scanning the whole instrument, I think, it is not enough. It'd be quite interesting historically. Yeah. Was there anything in the chat? I didn't check if there were any questions. Ah, yes, yeah, somebody. Uh, King Liu asked a question. Um, I think somebody is working on this topic. Aris Mazaris, sorry for uh, pronouncing this. You have, to, you have to say which topic, you know, like if you answer the question, you have to read it because. It's a big problem to keep the violin shape with isotopic material for acoustic violin. Do you have any comment or idea for this? Um, yes, I did print some uh, PLA violin, made more analysis of this, made a quite a good laugh with George about the results. And uh, because it's uh, very different from from wood, uh, I think th it is possible printing uh, uh, nowadays um, carbon fiber uh, reinforced FDM uh, um, printing. Uh, it is possible, and then you can choose how to orient fibers. I haven't done yet, um, but you uh, theoretically can. Um, give the material different properties in different direction, also with 3D printing. I printed some uh, plastic uh, loaded with uh, micro glass spheres, but you have a very rigid material, but it is approximately isotropic with a small isotopic but I don't think it's important. So if you want to make some playable volume, that is a different topic than making uh, something like uh, a gypsum cast of a nice violin to keep into your workbench and to as a, a reference for, for working and watching at it, then you need a very good surface definition. But if you want to make a playable violin with 3D printing, that is a completely different topic and a research more similar to the, the one that Tim is doing with the manual manufacturing. I hope I have the answer to this. Thank you, Hap. <laughs> okay, I think we should stop to move on to the next presentation. Thank you very much, Francesco.